I'd like to introduce Yuling. Um, so he's uh, just, I think he's just passed his PhD thesis um, at uh, the University of Columbia um, in New York um, under the uh, supervision of uh, Andrew Gelman. Um, his sort of interests are in, you know, uh, uncertainty in the M open world, um, sort of prediction in the Bayesian sort of um, world as well and, and post-processing. Um, he's got a significant track record um, of published papers and also helped with the, uh, the Lou package, which is a very common package for uh, Bayesian prediction stuff, um, and also um, some other packages as well. Um, he's had some significant work with applications as well, um, sort of along the lines of replication crisis and, and um, uh, election and uh, COVID-19 predictions as well. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Yuling, who'll be talking about some uh, Bayesian hierarchical stacking this morning. Cool, cool, thanks. Um, so I uh, actually, I, I recently graduated from Columbia and I will start my new job at uh, Fat Iron Institute at, at Simons Foundation. Um, and today I would like to um, talk something about um, model averaging. And, uh, and that's about our new paper on hierarch Bayesian hierarchical uh, stacking. And uh, I would like to start my talk by by two examples and hopefully we can have some insights on uh, why this new uh, method is necessary to deal with model averaging. Oh. So of course we are so familiar with the, with the famous quote that all models are wrong, right? But like, if you, if you really think about that, the model is wrong, not only because you have a wrong specification of the model, but also because like, Bayes rule somehow ask you to, to just pick one parameter in the very end. So just think about this, uh, this example, like we have uh, IID uh, outcome Y that's one dimensional and it's a, it's a mixture of two Cauchy uh, with probability P0, Y is from like Cauchy A1 and like with probability one minus P0, like this outcome y is coming from uh, uh, another co uh, another component of Cauchy, uh, Cauchy centered at negative a uh, one. And uh, of course, if I fit this mo mixture model, I, I get the parameter correct, right? Like now I just ask you to fit a, a one component of Cauchy model. Um, y comes from Cauchy mu one. And um, At some point, actually it's, well, of course we can say it's a wrong model. So everything you derive from this model is, is wrong. But then uh, you can also think about like, we can actually express the data generating process using this wrong model. If someone give you this inference that mu is a, 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 a with, with probability P0, mu is a spike at, at A and with probability one minus P0, uh, mu is a spike at negative A then you can actually recover this true determinant process uh, from this model. Uh, except you can't do this from Bayesian inference. Because if you really do Bayesian inference, you, you, you can't get a second inference. The only inference you can get is a posterior inference of mu given y. And, um, and if n is large, mu given y, instead of these two component mixture, if n is large, you, your inference of mu from this Bayes rule is always concentrated at either close to a or close to negative a. Um, so I mean, I mean, it can it can jump between modes if you have different realization of data, but but for every realization of data, you it's it's with almost sure probability mu given y will always get concentrated. Um, indeed, we can prove some theorem uh, about the concentration. Uh, and and it's not it's not exact a and my, uh, uh, negative a it's actually square root a a square minus four but it's close okay so so then it's bad it's like it's like it's like even if you can get some um, correct uh, model from this from this uh, 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 it's it's like it's like this model is wrong but it's not so wrong because because you can actually get the correct uh, prediction except your inference wrong. So should I sue the wrong model or should I sue the wrong inference, right? That's example one. And the second example I like is um, these two, uh, this two dimensional X and Y. X is uh, 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 on the interval zero to one 
and y is binary, either zero or one, and, and x is as uniform on uniformly distributed on zero to one, and uh, um, and, and y is a, a Bernoulli distribution with probability uh, with probability x. So that's the true generating process. And now if I don't know X, if I don't collect X during my modeling process, then I can have this, uh, this, this unconditional model, which says Y is Bernoulli 0.5, okay? Um, indeed, it's correct. Like if you ask what's, only, what's the correct model for Y, unconditional on, y, uh, on X, this is, the only, uh, this is the only correct model. And this optimal among all the uh, unconditional predictions. Uh, this M1, right? But, but actually we have access to X. So the second model we can um, construct is, is a conditional model. Y given X is square root X. Um, this is actually a wrong model, right? Because the, the correct model is actually um, Y given X is, is X. And, um, so it's wrong, uh, except if you look at into the average predicted performance, this wrong model actually does better than the, than the correct model, um, M1. Of course, you can say, oh, it's actually not the correct model. It's just unconditionally correct model. But if we do have X, then it's actually the wrong model. But then that's the same thing for every, for every applied data science problem that we have, because we can't have access to all the X. So I guess in that sense, it just means auto model is like, it's, it's, such a, it's just another reflection of all the models are wrong because you can't have access to all the X. And if you think about that, then only correct model should be deterministic, right? Because otherwise you can always collect more X to um, decrease the uncertainty. Um, so also, also if you have questions, you can just like uh, interrupt me. Um, so from these two examples, I want to um, deliver three messages. One is that um, by using Bayes rule, we have already assumed a correct model, uh, but it's never correct, so, so it's bad. And two is that the, the correctness of the model depends on what input information we want to condition on. Um, and uh, for example, here, uh, if, I, if, I, if I do not condition on, on X, then M1 is correct. Otherwise, M, M1 is not correct. So that's, that's bad. Like, it seems we shouldn't focus on like the binary distinction of whether a model is correct or wrong. We should focus more on the usefulness of the model. And the third message is that usefulness of the model actually depends on um, the location of X. For example, here, even though uh, M1 is generally inferior to M2. But if I know the future X is, com is, is coming around uh, 0.5, then M1 is actually better than M2 um, around those X. So the usefulness of the model depends on uh, the location of the inputs, uh, the location of future inputs. Um, and, and that's somehow the, the emphasis of, of this talk that, that is on the conditional model performance. And, 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 and if we want to uh, construct model averaging, uh, we should have some local version of model averaging that uh, reflects this local model performance. Okay, so um, since our models are wrong, we want to um, do model averaging. And uh, I want to start by this uh, uh, real application that um, sounds uh, exciting in some way. Uh, uh, so Andrew Gellman is involved in this uh, uh, prediction task for the uh, US presidential election in, in 2020. And uh, uh, it's, it's cool, it's, 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 it's from real data, it's from uh, all, sources, all sources of data. And you can imagine, you can always construct different models for the prediction, right? Um, you can have fundamental model, you can have uh, uh, the model from, from the polling data. You can also have like 
student t distribution for the for the polling error or like the normal distribution or log normal distribution. Um, you can of course try different models, but like what's a principled way to um, to utilize all the models. Um, presumably, if we have all, if we want to use other models, we can have better prediction, right? But like the second order question is that if we do really, if we really want to do model averaging, there's no reason to believe a model that it, that is good at explaining the, uh, the 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 prediction forecast in New York is the same uh, is the same is 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 also good in explaining California or like. Uh, Vermont, because like they're very different states. How could you ex how could you imagine like this universal good model that that is like good everywhere? Um, so we want some local model average in that um, um, assigns a, a weight to the model, and like the weight of the model should change in different states. But before that, let's uh, first review some existing method that can um, make model average. The first one is. Uh, Bayesian model averaging, except it's uh, it's not so Bayesian. So the idea is that if we have uh, uh, k different models, m1 to mk, and uh, uh, we can first derive the posterior inference of y given mk in each model, and then we can get this uh, uh, posterior probability of each model, mk given y, which is proportional to uh, the marginal likelihood. Um, and then we can compute any quantity of interest using this uh, Bayes rule. Um, it seems co coherent because everything's derived from Bayes rule, but there are some undesired properties of uh, Bayesian model averaging. One is that the method here is really sensitive on the prior. Um, it's not only the prior on the model list, it's also the prior within each model. Like if you change the, if you, cause that's a problem of marginal likelihood. The marginal likelihood is sensitive on the prior. Um, that's problem one. The problem two is that BMA will asymptotically select uh, 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 one single model in the list that is closest to the, uh, to the true, true data generating process. Uh, so in this sense, asymptotically Bayesian model averaging becomes uh, model selection, which is bad because we want models uh, averaging and we know none of the model is correct. So there's no reason that we want to concentrate on one model um, eventually. So to, uh, to address these issues, we had a paper on uh, stacking, uh, using stacking to average Bayesian predicted distributions. The idea is that um, this marginal likelihood is not a good uh, a predictive uh, quantity. Um, we would rather to look at a, a better uh, predictive quantity such as uh, the scoring rule. And, um, and in most practice, we just use the logarithm score. If you have a prediction uh, uh, parameterized by a density P, then we can judge how good this prediction is by looking into the log score, um, log PY. Um, and uh, but we can't just look at log p y because y is the realization of data, and like p is already the inference using that y, so it has some uh, overfitting issues. So we use uh, important sampling to get like uh, the, the leave and out cross validation version of the log score. Okay, this is just standard practice. Um, so. Uh, but, but this is like, but, but this, uh, but I just want to uh, uh, mention this because it's important for later developments. So uh, we will use this notation log P minus I to, to denote the uh, uh, leave I data out, leave I data out predictive density in the case model. So if you have K models and, uh, and N data points, then you should have a K times N uh, matrix of this uh, leave one out predict density. And that's also fast using pretty smooth important sampling uh, because you don't have to refit the model uh, n different times. You just run some important sampling. And the idea behind this important sampling is that if I change, if I delete one data point, I only change the posterior a little bit. So I don't have to refit everything. I only run important sampling to adjust for that difference. 
and it's fast. So we have this log score stacking. The idea is that um, instead of just finding, uh, 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 instead of just using the marginal likelihood to, uh, to weight different models, I now optimize over a list of uh, models uh, and the, the, the optimization parameter here is a simplex WK. Um, it has to be positive and they also have to sum up to one because um, they have to, because the summation of the predictive density st uh, still has to be uh, a density. So they have to sum up to one. And then we just op optimize over the simplex WK um, with this criterion that optimize over the uh, leave and out cross-validated log predict predictive density. And we know asymptot asymptotically, uh, if, if n goes to infinity, then we can ensure um, the uh, WK derived from this solution is optimal among all the linear average uh, of models. So that's good. Um, and uh, I also want to mention that this stacking idea is not only useful to average different models, but also useful to average different um, um, uh, computation components. Um, this is a reflection of the so-called the folk theorem of statistical computing that when you have computational problem, it is often a problem in your model. Um, and it, it is relevant because when we use MCMC, for example, if you run it in Stan to compute Bayesian models, um, it's likely that you, 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 like if you run multiple chains, you get very different results because some of the chain might just get stuck in some local modes. And uh, what should we do? Uh, well, we can either run a very long chain such that we can um, jump between those modes or we can um, change our model. But sometimes we just want a, a, a quick answer uh, because we want to uh, spend more time on other uh, components of the workflow. So is there any way that we can um, uh, reduce these um, costs? Well, here we propose to use stacking to uh, average over different chains. Uh, the idea is that we run multiple chains in, in Stan, for example, and you use stacking to, um, to, to you, you optimize using stacking to, to average over the weights of different chains. Um, and uh, this is the example of that Cauchy example that I um, previously discussed. Um, you can see uh, if I run, if I run Stan, okay, I will get uh, some of the chain gets stuck in one local mode and some of the chain gets stuck in, the, in, uh, in another local mode. The, the time of, I can't just use like how many chains get stuck in one local mode as uh, uh, the weight for the chain, because that depends a lot on, the, uh, on, on, on your luck. And also it depends on the initialization of the, uh, of the, of the MCMC sampler. So if we, if we use stacking, we actually, we can like, um, recover the uh, the true to the true process from this run inference and run model. So I'm not saying you should always do that when you have non mixing uh, compo uh, uh, non mixing computation, but it's sometimes a, a quick solution to the problem. And uh, I would like to refer to that as a blessing of multimodal posterior. <clears throat> and if we do some th theoretical analysis, at least in this Cauchy example the result from this uh, stacking of, of two of multiple, cha uh, multiple chains is actually better than the uh, exact Bayes solution. Uh, if the A, A is uh, the, the distance between that two Cauchy components. Um, and this has something to do with uh, how should we think about the Bay Bayesian consistency theory now, Bayesian consistency theory tells you that if your model comes from, if, if, if the data really comes from this model and there's a one theta that generates this model, then the Bayesian posterior will be asymptotically concentrated at that theta. But that's, but that, like, that's actually lame. Like if you, because we are not so interested in making this point estimate. What we really want is like a pluralistic uh, inference on theta. So 
in this sense, like if you have multiple modes, it's, it's actually it's actually good because like it because because then you can construct actually construct a, a more flexible family of uh, um, of predictive distributions that is not necessarily uh, get concentrated at at one of the local mode. And um, this is some examples of some multimodal posterior uh, distribution. For example, this is uh, latent uh, Dirichlet allocation on text data. And if you run stacking on, on, on non-mixing chains, you get a bit of better results. Okay? This is very short inference on horseshoe regression. Um, it, apparently it has two modes. So if you run VI, variational inference, you can only get one local, at least at most, you can get one local mode correct. But if you run stacking, you can actually get quite um, reasonable approximation to this two modal distribution. And uh, also for neural nets, which, which is another example in which it's known to have a lot of local modes. And if you run stacking, it will give you much better result than any um, single chain. But that's actually not what I want to discuss today because even stacking is very lame because two reasons. One is the model performance is local. So if you have a weight for each model, at best it can do is to weigh each model according to its overall performance. But, but for example, in election forecast, uh, um, we want some, um, uh, uh, in an election forecast, the model, uh, you, you would naturally, ex naturally expect that the model in different states should have different weights. And another reason we want to improve stacking is that um, we just don't like optimization method a lot in a way that it does not give you uncertainty. Um, you might have, oh, this is like, this model has like weight one and like that model has like weight zero. But like, should I really trust this one zero if they're so extreme? Um, is that overconfidence? Uh, we don't know. We don't have a conf we don't have an uncertainty measure on the stacking weights because it's from optimization. You get one number and that's all. So that's why we want to develop this hierarchical stacking. Um, the fundamental motivation is that. If some quantity may vary in the population, then it should vary. And this time we want these model weights to vary in the population. So let's first recall the objective function in, in, in stacking. Um, this is uh, uh, the log predictive density of the mixture uh, of different densities from, the, um, from k different models. Um, so it's log sum um, of k components. And um, uh, we want to do two things here. One is um, instead of this wk, we want to change this into wkx. So instead of making inference on a simplex, we want to make inference on a function, uh, actually k different functions, because wkx is now a function. And two, we want to make, instead of uh, doing this optimization problem, we want to run some Bayesian inference because we want to get some uncertainty measure of the, of the model weights. The naive solution is that we can just change this objective function as a likelihood. And you can do, if it's a likelihood, then if I add some prior on this WKX, because we know how to do like non-parametric Bayesian inference. We know how to put prior on, on, on functions. That's fine, um, right? And, and then we get this seemingly correct uh, posterior uh, uh, density, which is a component, uh, which is a summation of this log likelihood and log prior. Of course, that might be constant, but like that's irrelevant to the computation. Um, but then should ask why why it is okay to 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 translate this objective function into a log likelihood. Um, it's it's not always correct. It's it's not always trivial. For example, if you think about the linear regression, there are two ways to do linear regression. One is from uh, from optimization. We just do this least square uh, optimization, like y i minus x i beta, and like 
um, minimize beta, uh, minimize uh, the, the error on, uh, and then we get, uh, uh, like if you are from, uh, if, if, if uh, I think sometimes economists want this type of uh, 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 approach to linear regression because it makes no distribution assumption, right? You, you, you don't need a normal assumption. You just want um, least square. But if we are doing Bayesian, we do need some distribution assumption. For example, we can have this uh, normal uh, likelihood. Um, yi is, is normal with, with, uh, with, this, uh, with the center on xi beta. And uh, these two are of course equivalent in terms of point estimate of beta. But you can't just directly use the log posterior density from this negative L2 loss. Um, if, it's, it's evident that there's no sigma in this, um, in this L2, L2 loss. So I guess what I'm saying here is that it's not always trivial that how you should always, how you should uh, convert an optimization objective into a, a formal Bayesian likelihood. At least in this case, if you do this uh, uh, translation, it's, it's wrong. But it turns out in our, uh, in our case, that the naive translation is okay. Um, the reason is, is that if you think about uh, um, uh, the, how the data is generated. So for, in the first step, we have uh, these K different models. Um, so in, within each model, YI uh, has a likelihood that is from this YI given XI and MK. No, but but we cannot just use this as a we cannot use this mixture likelihood as uh, as the actual likelihood uh, because during this procedure we have used data twice um, we we first use data to fit an individual model y i given x i and and m k and then we also use data to to fit this um, to fit this w k x so so this is data we're using we we, we cannot uh, it's wrong. So to solve this data reusing problem, we can um, think about uh, uh, data augmentation. The idea is that hypothetically, if you have a holdout data set, the prime that had the same size of your observation, um, then we can, in, in the first step, we use this D prime to make inference um, on each model. So we get this uh, 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 likelihood, yi given xi given mk and, and D prime. And then in the second stage, we plug in observed xi and yi, and we get a point-wise uh, likelihood. So in this procedure, I, I, I do not use data twice, because um, 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 except I don't have access to d prime, because we don't have um, a hypothetical holdout data. So we can approximate this um, holdout uh, uh, predict density by using D1 out of correspondation because they asymptotically they are um, they are the same in expectation. So I just I just replace this uh, data augmented uh, predictive density using D1 out predictive density, and then I get the profile likelihood. Uh, which means I integrated out D prime. Then I get this WKX times PK minus I, um, the weight times, uh, uh, it's, it's just the same thing that we, we derived uh, in the previous slides um, um, here, the, the, the likelihood part. If we sum over YI. So this is the likelihood we would like to use. It's a log predictive density of the mixture uh, predictive density. And the mixture weight WKX is something depends on X. Okay, so for this likelihood, if we don't do Bayesian inference, there are two ways we can, we can make inference. One is complete pooling. Uh, that is the same as uh, the classic idea of stacking that WKX is, 
it's the same as WK. So it's uh, um, so we call it a complete pooling. Another another extreme case is no pooling stacking. And we we make separate organization of this objective function um, on each location of X, um, so that different X they don't have to talk. And what we want to do here is we want some partial pooling. On one hand, we want this model weights to, um, to change on X. On the other hand, we want this, this, um, this, we want different X to talk with each other and have some partial pooling. So, but we, it's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's of course uh, uh, trivial to do that in Bayesian inference because we can just put a hierarchical prior on, on WKX and uh, well, we can just use a Dirichlet prior because WKX is, uh, is, um, is is simplex, but uh, but uh, but a Dirichlet prior is not flexible enough. So we actually take a soft max transformation that transform this simplex into unconstrained space. Uh, we call it alpha one to kx. So alpha one to kx is uh, unconstrained parameter on on real lines, and um, and uh, if x is discrete. We just put a normal normal prior. Um, so, so if if I have j different groups, then alpha j k is a uh, uh, is a is a, is a weight of model k on the j's group, and uh, it has uh, the unconstrained weight um, or the logic uh, scale of the weight uh, is centered at mu k and has variance sigma k. And both mu k and sigma k are also hyperparameters that I want to make an inference. So I can put a hyperprior, which is also normal, just to, um, to make uh, some regularization on this inference. And the no pooling stacking becomes a, a special case of this approach by setting a flat prior. And the complete pooling stacking um, is also a special case by enforcing a concentration prior that sigma k goes to um, zero. It's the same thing as uh, in the classic hierarchical model that a no pooling model and complete, complete models are also a special case of the partial pooling model. And if we put all pieces together up to a normalizing constant, the log joint density of all three parameters uh, has this form. And you can see it's actually a, 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 a Bayesian model. So we can just run that in STEM. It's, 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 it's easy to run. Um, so it's it's actually cool that if you think about any it's it's like a machine learning algorithm except you can run that in a, in Stan. Um, and so far I've talked about the hierarchical stacking for the basic form, the discrete uh, form. Um, if we have more complex data, we need even bigger models, and like bigger models also needs uh, bigger model evaluation. So for example, if I have continuous input. I can use some regression form. Um, uh, uh, I can't exhaust all the uh, variation of how, how, uh, how I want to do this uh, stacking, but uh, here I just list some possible uh, 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 variants of hierarchical stacking in practice. Of course, that depends on the, the actual data you have. So here I have additive form, which is a regression of the model weights on your input. I can also put a Gaussian process prior on the on the weights, um, such that the uh, the 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 model weights can like it. You just put a Gaussian process prior on the unconstrained uh, uh, model weights, and uh, the previous uh, specification only take into account uh, independent uh, normal normal prior. We can also have. Uh, um, correlated prior, for example, in the for, in the election forecast example, um, maybe New York is close to New Jersey, so maybe they have similar like things. They are close. I would I would anticipate they have some correlation, and and I would also anticipate they have some um, they have similar model weights. I mean, it's of course related to this Gaussian process prior, except I just um, specify this um, prior correlation using some historical data rather than try to fit that using Gaussian process. And we can have some other more complicated structures such as group data or like sparse, uh, um, sparse model weights. 
But the nice thing is we don't have to reinvent them every time. We can just use um, Bayesian inference to, um, to incorporate with these more complicated priors. And also in time series, um, it's also easy to adapt to time series because we can just replace the leave one out like uh, predictive density by uh, one unit ahead predictive density. And then we plug into the previous formula and we get hierarchical stacking results. So here we have some examples. This is a Gaussian process. Um, the, the, the observational data is, is a one dimensional Y. And, um, um, and if we fit the Gaussian process regression, we get two modes. Um, and then we use this hierarchical stacking idea to fit a, a hierarchical stacking and the model weights uh, is, it's, is itself a Gaussian process. Um, and we get much better results than, than many other alternatives you can get. And uh, this is the example of the election forecast. If we are running this hierarchical stacking, it's always better than, than, than other stacking or like model selection or no pooling stacking. Although in this case, uh, the, the prior correlation seems to, um, seems to be not very useful. It's, it's quite close to um, independent prior specification. But we just get much better prediction results. So it seems if you can do hierarchical stacking, it's always a, a better thing to do than just uh, select one model. And also, it's it's like in many other cases, uh, the hierarchical stacking is uh, useful because it provides some robustness in small areas. For example, here depends on how big or how small the state is. Uh, the the uh, the improvement on the on the on the prediction is uh, is, is larger in the states in which you have smaller uh, polling data. So that's good. That's it's it's robustness in small areas. Because if you don't do hierarchical stacking, you don't have enough data to to fit them uh, to fit the model weights. That's why no pooling stacking is especially bad in small states. And uh, we can also look at the, the relation between uh, the, the partial pooling effect and the training sample size. It's evident that uh, the more training data you have in that state, the less pooling effect will be and, and vice versa. So, so if you have a lot of data, then hierarchical stacking is close to, to um, uh, complete pooling stacking, uh, no pooling stacking result. And if you have small state, then the model weight in that state is, is, is largely determined by, the, uh, by other states. And that's some type of stabilization. Another nice property of uh, the proposed method is that it's immune to covariate shift because one large problem in, in statistics is that the data is not IID and uh, perhaps the training data is not necessarily the same as future data that we might use in, in prediction. And uh, while well, certainly we can run some important sampling to deal with that in, in, in stacking, but then there's a tension between this average model fit and a targeted model fit at a certain location. The nice thing of hierarchical stacking is that we don't have to adjust the, the, the whole procedure because hierarchical stacking has already been aimed at point-wise fit. So that's some immunity. And, um, and the last thing I want to uh, briefly mention some, um, some theory on why this method is, uh, is, is good. Uh, this is about the diversity of models because we, we often say, oh, you should do model averaging if you have very different models, if you have independent models. But, but then it seems we don't have a, a comprehensive theory to quantify how different or how, or how diverse the models are. Sometimes people just say, oh, you, like you can look at the correlation of models. But then what is even like correlation of models? Because if we are talking about Bayesian models, like 
the output of your model is not a point as the, is not a point prediction. The output of your model is a predicted density. What's the what's the correlation of predicted densities? It's not even well defined, right? And like and like there's also no theory on how this correlation or whatever this diversity metric is on the effect of model averaging. So so I want something to quantify um, this um, this diversity of models, and to that end, we can think about to to we can think about a joint space of x and y, um, um, and um, if you have k different models for every x and every y, there must be some model that is better than other models. Of course, there might be tie, but let's just ignore the tie situation, suppose because uh, that's like with probability zero if you have different different models. So I define this JK, the location on which the model K is, is better than all other models um, in terms of predictive density. Then it turns out that the, 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 the complete pooling stacking weights is related to the probability of this PJK. Um, the probability means uh, the, the uh, the probability measure of this JK with respect to the true engineering process on both X and Y. Um, in a sense that if you use this PJK, it gives you quite um, uh, optimal result that is comparable to the, to the actual uh, optimization result. And to quantify the, uh, the diversity of models, we can use the supreme of, of uh, PJK um, denoted by rho here. And uh, through this deterministic function, the utility of the utility gain of stacking is actually lower bounded by um, by this um, deterministic function. Um, of course, it's a probabilistic uh, uh, statement because uh, it, dep it depends on uh, this uh, the previous uh, condition I have defined here. So, roughly speaking, the effectiveness the effectiveness of stacking indicates how like the how heterogeneous the the model fits are the more heterogeneous the, the models are the better gain you get from stacking from complete pooling stacking but then that's not the end of the story because i can also look at what if i i change from stacking to point y selection that is for every x i just select the model in which i know it has the best performance on that x it turns out this point-wise section also has this utility gain over stacking, which also depends on this, uh, this row X, this row. So paradoxically, if you have very heterogeneous model, uh, very heterogeneous model uh, fits, then stacking is much better than model section. On the other hand, point-wise model section is even better than, um, than stacking. And in that sense, that's the reason why we want to change from stacking to um, to hierarchical stacking, which gives you point-wise uh, model weights. Um, so this is just some theory which uh, uh, um, guarantees the lower bound of stacking and hierarchical stacking. But but of course, uh, uh, in terms of practical. Um, uh, uh, relevance. It's, it depends on how how uh, how this L and a and then epsilon is. It's it's an assumption that it's not really checkable. Um, but it's nice to have some theory guarantee. Okay. So I guess a take home message here. Uh, um, there are four take home messages. One is that model averaging is itself a, a, a model. Uh, like in time series, in, 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 in panel data, in spatial data, the model performance is itself time series or spatial or, or, or panel data. And if you are running model average and you have to respect those structures of the, of the, of the data and you want some, um, so, so I guess the, even though I give a, a, a fairly flexible framework for model averaging, but of course in, in, in practice, if you have more complicated data structure, you need to construct more complicated model averaging approaches.
And, uh, and two is that it seems for a very long time when we talk about model performance, we only have uh, a sense of average model performance. Uh, and, 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 um, but, uh, but, uh, but actually model performance is, is local. So maybe we can have, I guess in the future, it seems possible that we can have more developments on that regard. For example, uh, uh, like all the VC dimension or like all those uh, complex, uh, com complexity of the model can also be a local metric. Um, in addition, we can use hierarchical stacking to understand local model fits because uh, the weights is, uh, is a local metric and it gives you some sense of how good or how bad the model is um, in, in different locations of X. Um, it's better than just looking into the empirical or uh, model performance in different X, because that's a noisy realization of the data. Whereas hierarchical stack itself partially pulls across data. So it's, it's more stabilized metric. And the last is that the, the approach I presented today is, 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 is an approach that I uh, translates a black box machine learning algorithm into a Bayesian, mass, into a Bayesian model. And um, it's, it showcases how a Bayesian inference can actually improve uh, our machine learning algorithms in, um, in certain ways. It, it, it helps to, to stabilize it in, in small areas, it gives a formal Bayesian justification, and it's more, it's also easier to do a model check and, and model uh, evaluation. So I guess it means in the future, it's promising that we can also translate other uh, uh, black box learning algorithms into formal Bayesian models and to understand those methods in a, in a principled statistical workflow. Okay, that's that's my my talk today. Thank you so much, Yuling. Great talk. Um, we might have if there's any questions in the room, and then we'll open up. Yeah, did you someone over here? Oh, thanks so much. That was a fantastic talk. Um, so this is Leah. Um, I'm just asking a question basically about. Um, how the performance depends on your hyperparameter selection. So, for example, you mentioned that you could use a Gaussian process prior for the unconstrained right. weights, and I was just wondering how how you'd pick the bandwidth and how the performance would depend on that. Yeah. So, of course, that it's it's. I, I don't think there's a universal answer to like how to placing a prior because because we have a flexible model here. Like if I have a universal guidance on how to place in a prior hyper prior here seems the identical to say I have a universal principle on how to place in priors uh, at all. Uh, but uh, but in the paper we actually discussed some um, some default prior that we want to uh, we want to use in practice. Uh, on the other hand, in, in many uh, uh, applications, for example, in this election forecast, we realize it's it's not super sensitive on the hyper prior choice because uh, after all, it's hyper prior. But yeah, in the paper, we, we had some uh, practical uh, uh, solution to, to the default prior. I guess the default prior, the default prior is that you want you some uh, weakly informed to prior because here everything's so noisy because you don't even observe the local data performance, local model performance. You only have a very noisy realization of that because the likelihood is very weak. So you, with, you want some stronger priors. So we don't like, for example, half Cauchy prior. We just use half normal prior for everything. Right, that sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, hey, uh, yeah, um, this is Matt and uh, thanks. Yeah, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, yeah. I had two questions, if you don't mind, just quick ones. Um, yeah. Firstly, uh, a lot of the um, optimization functions that you had uh, looked like they consisted of sums of uh, log over i, where i is the observation number. Right. So is that implicitly some kind of independence between the observations that's going on there? Like, does this, how would this translate to um, uh, time series models? Do you need to change the um, function there? Well, it's, 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 I mean, to do cross validation, you always need some conditional independence. You need like data is, is conditionally independent uh, given X, given, um, given X. 
And, and for time series, we, 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 we actually don't, like in time series, it's never independent, but, uh, but, uh, 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 but we have the factorization that you can factorize the likelihood into, uh, for example, y n given y one to n minus one. So if you do like one unit ahead prediction, it's, it's, it's still okay to do, um, I mean, you can't use uh, leave and out crystallization time series. You need to use uh, one unit ahead prediction. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks, that, that clarifies it. Um, and then the one other question that I had was, um, uh, it feels like a lot of this is looking at uh, modal selection and so on as in a predictive framework. Can you still right. get metrics uh, regarding like modal parameters that you might be interested in? So for example, you'd have like marginal probability of inclusion in a Bayesian model frame, uh, Bayesian model averaging uh, framework. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah, so I think my understanding that I can always, like most of those things can be translated into um, a predictive quantity. Like, I guess, I guess I will not, like, I guess I'm not so interested in like, for example, the probability of a variable being included or not, cause like, um, a priori, I know like how can I, I like everything is correlated to everything. So there's no reason to believe any variable should be excluded because uh, it has zero probability. Um, but if I'm worried about the causal interpretation, for example, the coefficient of different parameters, then I should translate those things into a predictive quantity. And then I can use this, uh, uh, this predictive uh, uh, paradigm to, to answer those questions. Okay. Uh, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. Nothing here? Do you have a question? Yeah. Um, yeah, Yuling, I just wanted to ask a quick, quick one. Um, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the the way you're estimating the weights is based on like a linear predictor. Um, and I suppose my question is like, at what point do you start making the linear predictor for the weights more complex than the models themselves? Because I know in like an ensemble learning sort of framework, the aim is to have these very weak learners. So you know, this might lend itself to having some really sort of weak, unspecified, not very complex models. And in fact, make the complexity more in having the point-wise weights estimated. What are your thoughts on that? Wait, wait, what, what's, I, I, it seems you have two ideas here. One is like the linear additive model and like the other one is like weak ensembles. Yeah, so I suppose my question is, at what point do you make your, uh, you know, your, you talked about having K models that we're using to, and we're assigning the weights for each of those. At what point right. do we try to make each of those K models relatively simple and then make the linear predictor for the, the weights more complicated? Like right. where does the right. line? Right, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I guess your point is like, like somehow here we have a tension between the complexity of the, uh, of the individual model and the complexity of the second stage model. Yeah. And uh, I guess I guess in this framework, we actually require to to have like uh, good individual models because I, I don't think I don't think I will apply this to weak models because if I have very weak models, I, I, I like the second stage model will still be sort of be wrong because because you because 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 the model is like the model parameter is is fitted in 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 those individual models. So the second stage model can't uh, correct for those things. It's unlike if I'm running boosting in which the, the second stage model and the second, first stage model are fitted at the same time. Now in this framework, I can't. So, but, but on the other hand, you always, you, it's like, it's uh, instead of like to compete with uh, say boosting or like uh, local expert, local mixture of experts on, on combining weak learners, uh, I, I would more Im I would imagine more to use this method to combining uh, boosting and local mixture of experts with other models. Yes, the short answer is I want complicated uh, individual models. Okay, thank you, Yuling. Yeah, thanks for the talk, Yuling. Um, yeah, learned a lot after only vaguely being um, aware of, of, of this kind of stacking literature um, and your work is very impressive. Uh, I was just wondering from a practical point of view when I'm implementing this kind of framework for, for statistical inference, for statistical workflow, um, right. with your, the, the res, kind of the results that you showed at the end, um, should I be looking to 
select models that are, are diverse in a sense in order to improve my, my predictive accuracy? Well, I mean, I mean, A, it seems like, well, of course, in the paper, we, we try to describe the diversity of models using this metrics, but I guess there's still a, 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 a large room to, uh, for even for theoretical uh, development on how to really quantify the diversity of models, especially for Bayesian models. We don't have, we don't really have a good metric for that. If you think about the classical literature is about correlation and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and I guess what you are referring to here is that if we are really running a workflow in which we will running very, if we, if, if we are really running a walk, statistical workflow, we would encounter a lot of uh, models and certainly we want those models to be different. Otherwise there's no reason to fit many models. Um, so I would say it's a it's an ongoing project on how to how to how to really think about the diversity of models in a workflow sense. For example, if I think they are similar, I shouldn't fit the second stage. I I shouldn't uh, fit my models. And yeah, and then it's 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 also about like if I want to construct more diverse models, how should I do that? Yeah, I guess that I sounds like an even that. more complicated uh, question. Yeah, I guess I was thinking about like qualitatively, I know that a T distribution has a, a, a different characteristic to a normal distribution right. and use those qualitative characteristics to, to, to try and come up with um, diversity. Um, right. But I think you've explained that it's quite a complex question. Um, just one quick follow-up. What is the, 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 the K, like the number of models that you usually use or that you have used in your examples? Like what number is K? In, in the selection forecast, we actually had like, like roughly like five, to, I, I can't remember the exact number, maybe five or like seven something. It's not very big. Well, so if, if K is really large, then we also want to put some sparsity on the, on the model weights, because otherwise uh, it can be too uh, noisy. That's great. Thank you so much for your talk. Is there any cool. questions um, online? So just have a question from Andrew. Um, so where the different models are multiple linear aggression with various X values, and we may have more X values in data points, to what extent do the issues in linear regression, so if you do a scale that's the linear co multicollinearity, interfere with the model averaging process? Averaging with bad models might also end up with bad models, so to speak. Well, to be honest, I, I, I didn't really run experiments in which I have more uh, models uh, than, uh, than, uh, than X, uh, than, than data points. And, uh, oh yeah. So, so if, if I worry about like the multicollinearity of, of models, that's, that's like, depends on how, like, like that's, that's a whole point of why I want a better prior. So for example, if I, it's exactly the same thing if you are fitting a, a, a linear regression and you have correlated X, and then you want uh, some stronger prior. And the same thing here is that, that I, if that's the case, we would, uh, we would want to put some stronger prior on, uh, on the model weights. But, but yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no automated solution to, to that. Like that, that depends on like, for example, if I put a hostile prior, I sort of animate these concerns a little bit. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I think we'll end it there. Thank you so much for speaking to us, Yuling, and thank you for staying up late for us. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, yes, thank you so much, Yuling. We will um, be in touch. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Yuling.